Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke 1. Luke chapter 1. I don't know about you, but it felt like a big Hallmark Christmas movie in these last, this last during that announcements. Thank you, Janelle. That was so powerful to me. Yeah. And God is so good. And really well said. Really well said. It's powerful. Hey, have you ever had a conversation with a person and it goes something like this? Person 1. Wow, life is so tough right now, and I'm not sure how to get out of this crazy cycle. And then you respond with all your beautiful counseling education. (sighs) What do you think the next step should be so you can move out of it? Right? And person one responds back, man, I think my next step to succeed is blank. And if I just do blank, everything will be blank okay. And you respond, man, that seems like a really good idea. I think God's really on that. And then there's this this incredible moment. You're going in the right direction. Everyone say with me, right direction. (laughs) Everybody's going in the right direction. And the conversation is going exactly how you you think it should go. And and something happens, this pause, this really strange pause. It's something just invades that person's mind. And there's a change in countenance, there's a change in attitude, and then comes out the barrage from their mouth, all these excuses of why they can't do blank because of blank. Have you ever been in a conversation like that? And so they're on the right track and they're like, if I just do blank, then I I know blank will happen. And and then all of a sudden they come up with all these ideas, but man, I can't do blank because blank's gonna happen. And let's just be honest, sometimes they add blankety blankety blank in it too. Is that too real for you? (laughs) Yeah, don't fill in the blank. But uh, have you ever been in one of those conversations? And you're you're just trying to help a person along and they're just living in the blank. But can can I just be honest with you? Have you ever been the other person? Where someone's trying to help you and you've you've been the person filling in the blanks? And I I recognize that I've been there. There's so many times where I've sabotaged uh, just what I think God wants for my life, just by my very words and in my mind. And before these things that God has a destiny or desire to see manifest in my life, before they even have a chance to breathe, I, I just kind of crush the life out of them. Have you ever been there? I, I, I have been both person one and two so many times. I, I, it's just both equally frustrating. But the reality is that we got to get out of that cycle, don't we? My hope and desire this morning is that we would break out of that cycle. You know, you guys, I am so distracted right now. So I, I'm just going to stop and pray because I just, ah, oh man. There's just some people in our body, they're just, uh, they're just really hurting. And I, I really think this is going to be a timely word for them. But I just, I just want to pray in their grief that that's okay. So Lord, I, I, I don't have all the words to fill in the gaps for people's hearts right now, but, but you do. And I am reminded that your hope and your peace and your joy and your love is theirs right now. So Father, I just declare that in this moment, that you would fill in the gaps, whether it's someone watching live stream or it's someone in this room, that God, they would feel your love, your joy, your peace, your hope in this moment that they would know that they are loved, that they would know that we are family, that they would know we are with them, that God, that they are not alone today. It's okay to feel lonely, it's okay to grieve, it's okay to feel all of those things, but we recognize, God, that you're in the middle of all of it. And so we don't want to push you aside, we don't want to not let you be a part of it, we just want to say, God, would you move in the hearts of your people? Would you touch them, would you love them, would you comfort them? Would you help them to see that even tomorrow there will be a new sunrise and there will be a new moment to be written. But in this moment, just be the God of comfort and be with them now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Where was I? I, I, this, I know where I'm at. Don't worry, I got it. Uh, Thank you, though. I appreciate it. I'll be 52 tomorrow, but I haven't lost my mind yet. I haven't lost my mind yet. Praise the Lord. Well, maybe I did, and you just don't know it. Um, 
But the reality is that this pattern that we're in of words and sabotaging words, we, we do it often. We, we make statements that just refute the promises of God. We, we declare things over our lives that are not true at all. But, you know, we've just grown up in it. We've just built into it. And then, you know, media and all of those things kind of just keep pushing into it. Or maybe there's even someone in your household that's just kind of echoing the words that you're saying over yourself. And it just, it's just not getting you where you need to be. Have you ever been there? And so what I, what I hope that I can give this morning to you is just some, some basic truths on how to kind of break that cycle. Because I really believe that as we finish up this year and we move into next year that this, this, this 2020 has to have a, a new dawn. It has to have a, a new day. It has to have a new experience for us as the body of Christ. And I, and I think it's found in just this simple statement that I was really praying into over the last couple of weeks to share with you. And if we could put it up on the screen, it'd be great. It says this, declaring God's promises over your life will help guide and define the destiny that God and you desire for your life. Let me just say it again. Declaring God's promises over your life will help guide and define the destiny that God and you desire for your life. And if you feel comfortable, why don't you read it with me? Declaring God's promises over your life will help guide and define the destiny that God and you desire for your life. Now notice with me that the quote does not say declaring God's promises determines your destiny. Now, I want to unpack that because I know for some of you in the room, that might be a little bit of a confusing statement or a statement that you actually agree with. And I'm not here to criticize it. I just want you to be clear that that's not what I said. Because I don't want us to just uh, reduce God to being our errand boy. Because sometimes we can do that by, by that kind of statement. I'll declare God's promises and it will determine my destiny because, God, you're going to do what you said you were going to do. And if you don't do it, then I don't know if you're really God. So, God, you're going to have to be my errand boy to make sure this comes true in my destiny. So what I did say was this, this statement. Declaring God's promises over your life will help guide and help, right, and define the destiny. Now, this order is really important that God... And then you desire, okay, for your life. Because many times we put that order the other way that this destiny will, you know, be about you and what you desire and God, you need to align to it. Okay, so I want us to be really clear that, that this whole thing is that God really has a destiny over your life. God really wants us to declare promises over our life. God really wants us to declare promises over situations, but don't reduce them to being an errand boy. Because he's not. God of the universe is much larger, much bigger, much more powerful, much more creative than anything that you could say with a formula out of your mouth. How, how are we doing? I'm going to make some friends and lose some friends, and by the end, we're going to be all friends again, okay? So I, I, I feel like... I, let, let me just kind of pastor this moment before I kind of dive in, if that's okay. Because I think I want to bring some clarity to this, because... It, it becomes really confusing for people. I think where we get into a dangerous liaison with the idea of simply just declaring God's promises, thinking that they will determine our destiny based on a formula, is, is, is a, can be a shadowy place. Let me just say that. The concept is called this, positive confession. Say that with me, positive confessions. Now, let me just go on the record. I think positive confessions are better than negative confessions. I think that is absolutely true. I think positive confessions are way better than negative confessions. Now, you may not even know what that term is. And, and again, it, if I put it in this other more popular vernacular, you'll get it right away. That there is this whole understanding, a popular way of saying is that if I name it, I can claim it. The more ghetto version is this, if I blab it, I can grab it. <laughs> and I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this really clearly. I, I am not here to criticize that movement. I'm not here to criticize the people that lead that movement. I am not here to give you weapons against that movement or, and you're going to hear in just a moment, for you to justify why we could be in this position. I, I just want to bring some clarity from my own heart as I, as I walk in these, what we would call positive confessions, what, we, what I walk in the declaring of God's promises, I just, I want to give you some clarity on how I see it. You may not agree with it, but this is, this is how I see it. But please hear me, I, I, I don't have time to criticize people. I don't have time to criticize movements. And you know, let, let me just do this. Uh, 
We live in a season of sound bites. And what happens now, especially I think for the church and the body of Christ, is that we get these little clips from people and we say, that's their whole theology. That really bothers me. Because I think what we do is we, we reduce our mind to just give me the sound bite and that's who they are. I know some remarkable people that move in the spirit of God so powerfully that if you reduce their life to a sound bite, you're not getting the full picture of who they are theologically, who they are in their character and their gifting. So I just, I want us to be careful of that because we, we start grouping people into categories theologically and it, 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 it bothers me because then we, we feel like we have the right to criticize them. And you know what, to be honest with you, beloved, we don't have time for it. And this is always my, woo, I'm on a little rant right now, I'm gonna bring it down just like a few notches. Because it's Christmas after all. <laughs> my, my question always back to people when they, when they have so much time to criticize the body of Christ. Now I understand, oh, we've got to be careful of heresy, all this thing. I, I get all that, I really do. And there are smarter people than I that want to think about it, and smarter people than most of us that are thinking about it. My question back to people all the time is that, when's the last time you loved your neighbor? When's the last time you baptized someone in the name of Jesus Christ? When's the last time you prayed for someone when they didn't even ask you to pray for them and you're lying? But, oh Lord, we have so much time to criticize whoever on TV or whoever has a sound bite. Let's just stop that. Let's just be about the business of the kingdom and the unity of Christ and let him sort it out in the end. You know, I'm an interesting role in the position I'm in, not as just as your pastor or superintendent. People are always getting on me about making some kind of soundbite about someone who says something in the Christian world. And I said, I don't have any time for it. I have other things to think about, like my neighbor's coming to Jesus and filling his house. And I gotta trust that God will take care of the rest of it. I was not appointed to be the referee for the kingdom of God. Lord, you're, you're messing with me today, and I, I got to be online, okay? So let's just get it straight here. Okay, so back to this. this. This is important to me, you guys. It really is, because I believe in this so, so, so passionately about really confessing the promises of God. But sadly, what has happened is that the extremes, some of the extremes that have happened through this message of name it and claim it have caused so many of us to avoid it and, and fear it. And that breaks my heart too. Because we've seen the messes of it, so we're like, we gotta stay away from that. And what I, what I would just suggest is, listen, it's not gonna lead you to a place of poor theology to move into something that is so scriptural from the very beginning of declaring, God declared with his mouth that let there be light. There's power in our tongue over life and death. I mean, he's given us authority to speak. I, I believe that the declarations of his promises are aligned in God's will. I really believe that. And I, I just don't want you to, to camp in a place because of some people's extremes that are like, I gotta throw everything else. I, I just think that's not a good place to be. And I, I would just say this, you know, we always say, you know, if you bad apples spoil the bunch, then just put the apples in a different bunch. And let God deal with that, that bunch. But I will say this, love that bunch. Because they are doing what they feel God has called them to do. We're gonna love them through that too. But don't, don't throw it all away. Don't kind of criticize what they're doing because there's power and what happens is when we fear it, we lose all of the things that God really wants to do that, that through uh, this positive confession, through declaring, uh, declaring God's promises, there's something that God really wants to do. There's something that God wants to really want us to lean into the possibility of what God wants to do. You guys are so silent out there. You're freaking me out. But someone told me it means you're thinking, and I'm just going to hold on to that. Because here, here are a few things that I think about this. this, this the, when we declare God's promises... They're not simply just positive confessions for our own pleasure or success. Here's the line for me. When I know where I'm drifting in a way that's really about me and not God and I want God to work out my formula so he'll do what I asked him to do. For me, the line is this, that, that these confessions of my mouth, these declarations of my mouth are for the advancement of God's kingdom 
the advancement of God's will and making Jesus famous on the earth. So I will declare them all day long. And can I just say this? If you're confessing his promises without a covenant of relationship, stewardship, sometimes the suffering in the midst of coveting that promise with him. I mean, Jesus had a covenant and a promise with the Father, and it wasn't easy. But he declared it with his mouth that this is what's going to happen, and he had to do it. But it was a relationship, and I think without true accountability of community and the maturity of hope with those around walking us through these promises that really, that if we're just going to reduce it down to a formula or these, these just a few sentences of a word, that I, I think you're going to end up being disappointed a lot. Rather than when we can proclaim God's promises over our life, it's all about relationship and a holistic approach to that relationship through my salvation in Christ, His word, prayer, uh, generosity, service to humanity, service to creation, community, fasting, worship, discipleship, humility, and teachability. I, I really believe that when we, when we align our lives that way, not just from the declaration of my mouth, but the declaration of my hands and my heart and my feet, when something gets all aligned together, God says, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. That when we, we align it, because otherwise we're, we're, we're saying something, but who are we saying it to? And, you know, I, I'm in, I'm in. And again, let me go back. I would rather people said positive things over their life than negative things. So Oprah and I agree on that. <laughs> I do. I really do. I think it's even proven medically that it'll be better for you. But think about this. If you can align your mouth with the mouth of God in a covenantal relationship to say, I will advance your kingdom, I will advance your will, and I will make you famous on the earth, God is in that. And it'll help guide and define your life and your destiny because I don't want us to reduce it down to some formula of profession for our benefit. Because it makes God out to be someone who serves at our pleasure, not the God of salvation and creation who I serve at His pleasure. Amen. So we're discerning and we test these things in community. We don't throw out all the benefits because a few undiscerning moments and people have messed with it. Or can I just be honest and say, I've been there. I've declared some things and you know, I've looked back and go, well, I shouldn't have declared that over that person's life. I put myself as, as if I was their savior. But I didn't live there. I moved on and I somewhat grew up. You know what I mean? So I want to give grace to the people that are on their journey who messed it up too. I guess as I'm getting older now, <laughs> I just feel like we got to relax a little more. How, how are we doing out there? Are we all right? Is that all right? I, 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 you know, actually, I don't need your affirmation because then that'll mess with my head. I just, I just want to pastor you. And I want you to start declaring promises over your life. But I want you to declare them in a way that is wholly biblical. So that it aligns to see his will and his kingdom advance and make Jesus famous on the earth. Not to make you look good. And to stop, to stop criticizing people. It's like, if you just did it this way, your life would be good. If you got Jesus, your life is good. It's better than you think. What? Because he's so good. He says, let's add some stuff on it. However, with all that said, I, I feel there are some declarations of God's promises that absolutely have the strongest possibility of determining your destiny. Would you like to hear some? Yes. Yeah, I'll tell you later. Okay. Because I think a large majority of the promises for us declaring out of our mouth on earth are tied to working out those promises in real life and in real partnership with God and others. I, I've had umpteen words spoken over my life and they have like Mary I am treasuring them in my heart but like Mary she treasured them in her heart but then she started carrying them into her womb and then she started to birth them 
You hearing me? Yeah. So, you know, we, 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 there's a partnership. And I, can I just, I, I don't know God's mind entirely. I know that I'm his favorite because <laughs> he tells me a lot. I mean, think about it. I, I need all the encouragement I can get, man. But I, I do think that there's things that he, he wants us to partner with. And I think he really enjoys partnering with his people. Because I, I think he likes to step back and go, see what we did together? I love that. So let's unpack how we can do this. Because I don't know, have you, have you been there? Where you sabotage the opportunity with your words or you're declaring it in a way that is determining what you want more than what God really wants. And so let, hopefully I'm going to try to help you unpack that and clean that up a little bit. So we're in this series, Christmas Promises, and we find ourselves in Luke 1, and I, I just shared the definition of what a promise is. Why don't we throw that up there somewhere up there? A declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen, and Hebrews tells us, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope, right? Our mouth, without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. This partnership of God, so many great promises in God's word, so many promises over your life that he wants to align you with to, to say, God, I, I want this in my life today. I want it into my life tomorrow. Yeah, come on. In my life in 2020, I, I want that. And we're going to find that this story that we've been hanging out in, in the Luke chapter 1, and if you haven't been with us for a while, you can check it out on some of our, our social media stuff. But just, it's so important because we're going to look at these two characters again and and there's something that God has shown me through this, these promises, through his word of what we, we need to do to declare our promises to align with his heart, making Jesus famous. So if you're a Luke one, say amen. amen. Put your hand in your heart, one hand in your Bible, and say this with me. Father God, open my heart to receive your word today. And Holy Spirit, open my mind to receive your truth today. And Jesus, bless my neighbor, live out your commands today. I've been sharing in this, this story, as we have over the last several weeks, that even in this story, these two unfamiliar characters of Christmas, Zachariah and Elizabeth, it's so interesting that their very names mean promise, right? That the Lord remembers his promises, that God will be faithful in his promises. So these two amazing couple, and, and for, just to be honest, you guys, I, I didn't grow up in the church, so I didn't know much of the Christmas story. And so when I first started reading the Bible, I, I didn't know who they were. I was like, wow, that, that's cool. Why are they even in the story? But man, I'm so glad they were in this story. I've learned so much from their lives. And just in their very names, this declaration of promise. And we've looked at their lives, and particularly Zechariah, just what it means to have a prep in the promise that you're prepping your heart for. Then we've talked about the potential of promises. And Pastor Ammer just did a great job last week talking about the pause and the promise. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And today I just want to talk about how we can declare them out. So you know the story, Zechariah is a priest and he's in the temple and he has this once in a lifetime experience to, to get in there and, and burn some incense to offer a prayer for the nation and, and of course to see God move in the people of God and he does his thing and the angel Gabriel shows up and let's just pick up on what happens when Gabriel shows up in verse 18. Zechariah said to the angel, and this is after, of course, the angel Gabriel has just, you know, thrown out some remarkable promises to him. And Zechariah says to the angel, how will I know that this is so? For I'm an old man and my wife is getting on in years. That's so polite. <laughs> At least he got it in the right order. <laughs> and the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I love that. Just, I am Gabriel, period. <laughs> That's so great. No last name. I'm just Gabriel. And I stand in the presence of God. Have you done that lately, Zechariah? And I been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news and so here there's the promise right and then this is the line that's just like oh but now because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time you'll become mute unable to speak Luke kind of leans in as we will read later that not only is Zachariah probably unable to speak he's unable to hear <laughs> until the days these things will occur so he says listen because of your words these things that I've given you, you're not going to be able to speak out words. And so what happens is he, based on his response, just this simple word, silence. And I want us to catch something here, and I want us to really look at it again. The angel says, because you did not believe my words. So he's, 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 he's praying for a promise to come. The promise comes, and then he doesn't believe the very thing he asked God for. Have you ever been there? 
And then what God does is, because you don't believe my words, you will not be able to declare words. Silence. This is really important because declaring God's promises over your life will help guide and define the destiny that you desire for your life. But listen, denying, doubting, or debating God's promises over your life will also guide and define your destiny. Those three Ds will get you. And they will usually result in some form of silence. And so I just want to give some language to your heart because some of you might be in that place. And you're like, I don't know why God's so silent. I don't know why my words don't have any power anymore. I, I'm, I'm hopefully going to give you a little bit of language to the heart. Because we don't, we don't understand what happens as a result of this silence that God actually has put on Zechariah. The, the first thing is this, is that it will impact other promises. That's really important. And it will impact other people. These denials are peep. Well, that's not spelled right. I'm hoping someone noticed that. <laughs> Last night, Saturday, nobody mentioned it. So I guess they're just saying it impacts Piopes. <laughs> There's so much power back there. Thank you so much. I sent the slide, I spelled it Piopes. It's not a prophetic thing. It's not a new word. I don't know what it means. And if it means something bad, I'm so sorry. <laughs> impact other promises, impacts other people. Because you know this, this denial, this doubt, this debating with God that we often do. Let's just, just admit it. We do it. We don't recognize for Z what happens is he does this incredible sacred thing in the temple. Then what he's supposed to do is come out of the temple to where all the people are who have been praying for this moment to hear kind of what God is saying over the people of God in a prophetic sense. He's supposed to declare these prophetic promises over the nation. Silence. And I I want us to hear that, that when we debate and doubt and deny the promises that God has given over our life, God in his goodness will cause you to silence. But you don't realize the consequences. It is impacting other people around you, and it is impacting the other promises that you can declare. But what happens is we're like, well, maybe God will just get over that. Can I just tell you, beloved, God never forgets. He doesn't forget our moments of denials or doubts or debating, and, but he doesn't do it in a punishment way. He just says, why don't we just pause here and grow there? But what we want to do often is move to the next promise. So we debate and we doubt and we deny one of the promises that God has given us that he wants us to declare with our very own mouth, the very thing that's in our heart. And God says, silence. But what we do is like, because we want God to be our errand boy, we just go to the next promise. Well, I know you have a problem over this, but I'd like to do this now. And then we wonder, why are you silent, God? Why is there no power in my words over relationship, over situations, over finance, over health? Maybe it's because God in this beauty of discipline and discipleship wants to take you right back here and say, let's wrestle with this one. But we don't realize that this thing, when we, when we are not declaring the promises of God and believing them to help guide a destiny of our life, beloved, silence occurs and we get frustrated with it. We get angry at ourselves. We get angry with God. We get angry with other people. It's like, why isn't God moving? Because he wants in his love not to hurt you, but just take you back and say, let's work out that one. Let's figure that one out. Could it be that God is teaching us how to steward promises? But if we're always going to deny and debate and doubt them? Now, again, I don't know the mind of God, but I'm thinking, I'm a father. And if my children want to deny and debate and doubt the promises that I want to give them right here, and then they come to me and ask me for new ones, I'm like, well, you don't even want to steward the first ones i.e. goldfish (laughs) let's get a dog how about the goldfish (laughs) they're not here so i can talk about them right now and if they're online i love you why aren't you in church anyway so (laughs) and i'm gonna hear about that too because i know one is watching right now i love you it's my birthday tomorrow i love you okay so uh, but you know what i mean you're with me on that right you you guys get it because he's teaching us how to steward them 
That's important. And then I think it's also important to recognize that this not only impacts our promises uh, of other promises and other people, it, it impacts how these promises are helping and guiding me. And this is really where I, I want to get to. Several months ago, I, I was really struggling over a situation. You ever struggle over stuff? <laughs> only about five of us. <laughs> and um, I was really struggling. And so what I try to do, I, I mean, I have my own devotional time. And just so you know, just self-admission, I have my own devotional time. It's, just, it's not about you. I, it's just about me. Because otherwise, if I find myself that all my devotional time and prayer time is just about you, then, then I, my tank is empty and then I have nothing to give to you as your pastor. So I, it's really important to me. I think it's sacred time. So I'm really struggling with the situation and I usually go to God's word and I start reading through his promises, start declaring them. And so I found myself in this passage, Luke 1. And so I'm just sitting there, my little dog, little furry dog that I take care of, by the way. And, um, and, and I'm sitting there, not even relevant to the story. It, you know, you know what I mean? So I'm sitting there and, and I'm reading through and I'm reading Zachariah's story. And this is what I'm doing in my mind because I'm struggling over situation, over what I, maybe the words I'm like, and I'm just denying and debating and doubting that God could break through in this situation. So I'm reading Zachariah. So what do you do? Zachariah, what's your problem, man? God shows up, he sends the angel Gabriel. How many of you like the angel Gabriel just to show up into your house? You'd be like, what up? That'd be crazy, right? I would love that. And you know, I'm just like, Zachariah, come on. And he's got all these excuses and I can't believe it. I mean, you've been praying for this and now it's gonna impact Elizabeth and the people. And I'm going on and on and on. And then I pause, I take a sip of my chai tea. And I, I, it hasn't even touched my lip. And God's like, yeah, Zachariah, that reminds me of somebody. <laughs> you. And I realize God in his grace is saying, Fraser, your words matter and it's shaping the ability to speak over something to have great promise in their life. It's a tough one, man. Have you ever done that? Over your work, your calling, your family member, relationship, finances, health. You're just speaking denial and doubt and debating, God, can you do it? Why are you doing it? Why didn't you do it? And, And God's just like, Your words have power. Amber talked about that last week. So power. Our words have so much power. And we miss that this thing. And then finally I was reading the passage and it gets to this point and, and his name will be John. And I'm like, that's it. And then as I share with you, you know, John's name means to be gracious, to show favor that God, even in my stubbornness and denial and debating and doubting, he just says, my promise is to have grace over your life. Oh, man. God responds to our prayers and our requests and these things that we declare with our mouth with grace and favor, beloved. That's when you know you're aligning your words right with God because grace and favor come and then it aligns our mind and we start thinking of noble things and praiseworthy things and things of excellence. And the result of that, Philippians tells us, is that there's a, this is surmounting uh, ability of, of peace that comes into our life because of it. And could it be that when you're, when you're declaring your promises and you're not feeling the peace, it's because maybe God's working on other places of your mind that are in the denial, the debating, and the doubting. But God in his goodness and his mystery helps us kind of figure this out. But boy, he, he really pushes this. And this is such a weird word to use with grace, but sometimes it's an awful grace, man, because he's just working it in there deeply into the situation, removing the fact that I want this to work out my way, my timing, and for him to start working on it as quickly as possible, because this is an absolute inconvenience until he gets this done. This awful grace is massaging it all out of my body and my heart. 
And then the conversation, like I began at the beginning of the message, is this now. It's more Z and, and Gabriel, right? Z says, man, my life is tough. The nation is tough. The people of God are in a tough place. And Rome is oppressing us. And I don't know what's going on in my personal life. Elizabeth's mad at me. I don't know. And Gabriel shows up. He says, man, I've heard your prayer. And you have some amazing next steps. And here they are. And I, I think we can line it up. And Z goes, and this is not in there, but this is how I think about it. And yeah, I'm going to have a child, and you're going to send the Messiah, and he's going to be the forerunner, and it's going to be about grace and favor, and man, I can't wait to tell Elizabeth, this is a great plan, and Gabriel's like, that's fantastic, Zeke, you got it, and then there's that moment that we all do, like I shared at the beginning, that pause, a change in countenance, a change in attitude, and Z goes, but in order for blank to happen, blankety blank has to happen, and blank, All of us do it, don't we? And then there's these nine months of agonizing silence. Fast forward me to chapter 1, verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her. Because when you're declaring your promises with God aligned to his heart, other people are happy. Because now you have power of your promise being fulfilled in front of them, and they start to rejoice, and it impacts others. The silence is starting to be removed. And on the eighth day, they circumcised the child, and they were going to name him Zachariah after his father. And this is, this is awesome. But his mother said, no, he is to be called John. I don't know if Z passed a note to Elizabeth. I don't know how she found out that his name was going to be John. But I love that mama knows. No, he is to be called John. Period. And then this gets under my, my nerves here. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's God's word. It, it's, it's all beautiful. <laughs> they said to her, none of your relatives has that name. Why can't they just believe Elizabeth? A different message. Women know stuff. And they can proclaim it with their mouth. Period. Right, so, you know, then they, they motion to Zechariah. That's why people think that maybe he couldn't hear also, not just be, find out what he name wanted. And he gets the writing tablet and he writes down, what do you think he says? His name is John. How long do you think Zechariah has been thinking about that little phrase? Nine months he walked out of the temple. His name is John. His name is John. He can't even say it. It's just in his head. His name is John. His name is John. I should have just said that. I should have just said that. His name is John. And I would have been able to speak. I would have been declared promises over people. I would have been able to just run over to Elizabeth and say, Wow, we're going to have a son. His name is John. 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 John. That's all I would have said. John, 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 John. Grace, favor, grace, favor, grace, favor, grace, favor. That's not a bad mantra. Finally gets to write it out. And all the people are amazed. What? A couple agrees on something? Anyways, they're all amazed. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue freed and he began to speak. And what does he speak? The praises of God. He doesn't come out with, it's about time, God. I mean, I've been waiting nine months to talk. And where have you been? Immediately he begins to praise God. The breaking of silence over a promise is coming back to declaring the promise again. It's giving you now the power to really speak it because you know how to steward it. Sometimes it takes nine months. Sometimes it takes a little longer, beloved, for us to learn how to steward that promise of grace and favor over the life that God wants to help guide our destiny. I, I, I hope that you're here in this moment and something is happening in your heart where you're remembering a promise that God has given you, a place where you've denied it or debated it or doubted it. Let's just be honest. We've been there. Whatever category it is, we've been there. I hope God is kind of bubbling that up into you right now to remind you of something. Because I, I don't want you to wait nine months to declare it out to be free. I don't want to rush it either. Because you don't want to rush a baby being born either. Right? You don't want that. They call it what? Premature. So you want the, the, the promise to be matured. And sometimes that's the maturing of you so that you can steward it when it's born. Right? That's why it's different than just popping off a confession. 
Because we can pop off confessions, but we may not be able to steward the responsibility of what that confession is. That's important, right? But when you're there, you recognize, it's like, all right, God, you're, you're doing something there. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for this breakthrough to happen. Then you start calling out grace and favor. His name will be grace and favor. This promise will be grace and favor in this moment. I think there's just a liberation of your mouth through praise when you start declaring God's promises because it starts to align the destiny and it starts determining some things that you've never even thought could happen because you're saying, wait a minute, worship will go before me and we'll start opening doors I couldn't even imagine. I shared on the back of your sermon notes there are some Christmas promises from this really great ministry called Igniting Ministry. And, um, and I, I really have appreciated their heart as, as their approach to declaring promises and these confessions of God. And I think they're really just soaked in the idea of advancing the kingdom and advancing his will and making Jesus famous on the earth. And they're, they're simple Christmas ones. I think on, on his, he has like 35 of them, but I just grabbed 11. Maybe for you today, you're thinking, no, phrase, I'm good. I'm not in the place of denying or debating doubt, but, but I have some, I, I don't have a promise. I've had that conversation with many people through this series. I don't, I don't have a promise. What is this promise? Everybody should have a promise. I mean, there's lots of them in God's word. You know, we start grabbing them. But the, there's some, some simple statements that maybe over these next couple days, you'll take the time to read them out loud in your personal devotional time over situations and family. And I've, I've picked a whole bunch of different ones that are different situations. I know for me, there's some that I'm declaring over my own family for this Christmas believing for some remarkable breakthrough that I can align my heart with where God's at. Maybe that's you this morning. You know, last night I shared a pretty vulnerable story about just about a journey that I've been on with a uh, with piece of land behind us. So 11 years ago, when we began this process of of wanting to move into this building and we were praying and one of the things that uh, when we found the space was the land behind us and man my heart just really leaped and man I'm looking around some of the people in this room we prayed in that land we laid in that land we staked that land we kicked gophers out of that land we just did a lot I, I think we buried a baseball in that land we just did all kinds of crazy Jesus stuff in there and and I, I remember, you know, I, when I was there and we were praying and I thought, man, this is going to happen. We're, we're going to get this land. And I had the, kind of a limited idea of what that land could do or what it should do. And then when we moved in and, um, you know, we didn't get the land. The, the, the land sold and then another person bought it. And I thought, okay, well, maybe we have another opportunity here. And then, then it sold again. And then, then it was really interesting. Um, yeah, Mark's not in the room, but Mark Zelmer and I sat in a room right over here with these two guys and, from Texas. And they're, they're these big Texas Christian guys. And, uh, and I thought, in my mind, okay, you know how your mind goes. My mind's like, all right, they got two Christians. They don't even live in the state. They're going to buy this land. They're going to give it to us. That's what I'm thinking. End of the meeting, that's not what happened. And so, and so they, they bought it and they put this building on there. And I, I gotta be honest with you guys, man, those last, these last several years, my heart just broken over this thing. And, uh, and I went through all these denials and debates and doubts over it. My personal life, like, ah, I, couldn't, I didn't lead well, I don't know what I'm doing, I, did I not hear you, God? I mean, so many negative confessions. Do you know what I mean? It's been really vulnerable with you. It's a really real deal for me. You know, and every day I drive and I, there it is, a reminder of my failure. You ever been there? <sighs> Broke my heart. And uh, just wrestling with all the denial debates and doubts of it. And, and then I, I was with some friends and we had dinner and they just sent me this crazy video, this crazy young pastor and and it, it wrecked me, wrecked me. And I finished, you know, listening to it. And I was in my car, I was on my way to Saturday night service. And I, I just parked in the parking lot up there. And, and I just repented before God. God, I'm so sorry that I've 
denied and debated and doubted myself and the people and you and the land and really getting to the point it's not even about the land it was just something about you needed to teach me things in my heart and all these things that were just oh just oh such a wild life lesson and then then I, I was reminded, I just started declaring over the space. It's like, okay, God, you're going to do something there. And, and so just scary, crazy things in my mind, declaring bigger than I thought that, more than putting a swing set on that piece of dirt. And, you know, I've had maybe, wow, they, they built our building. And I love that a crazy level of faith people have. Like, wow, they just built the building for us. That's fantastic. And I'm like, okay, that's great. And but I thought, maybe, maybe it's more than that. And then I remember Jeff Tarbell and others were like, maybe, 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 Fraser, it's about God creating some marketplace ministry in there that it's going to manufacture something that's going to touch the entire world. That will provide jobs for people and fund parents' college tuitions for their kids so that when kids come out of college they they're not broke already and maybe there's some healthcare things and some housing things that we can do in our community maybe there's some things that would create jobs and release people into their destiny and yeah maybe we could use some of the space but it just began to get bigger than me and i said man that's not even big enough for what i think you could do god do you know what i mean but I had to get to the point where I was wrecked over the fact that I kept denying and debating and doubting. And I was keeping God so small that I had to rewire my mind to declare the promises that are bigger than that. And to be reminded that my work here was to be a wedge for the next generation. That was an agreement that God and I made. I said, okay, we'll do this fundraising thing. We will get in this building and we will put our blood right on this floor, literally. Literally. And I'm bald. I bang my head so many times and there's like literal blood <laughs> on the floor. But it wasn't supposed to be for me. And I remember telling our body at these dinners, like, this isn't going to be about, we're going to write the checks, you guys, but it's not going to be for us. And God reminding me again that think bigger, think farther. Stop denying and debating and doubting my promises. Align your life and declare them. And can I just say this, beloved? You might be in a chapter right now where the, the description of your chapter is all drama and horror. But the next chapter could be comedy and a great amount of joy and laughter. Because if God is good, then the story's not over. And you might be in a chapter where it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't, doesn't like seem like it's working out. But it's not over. The story's not done. It's not done. The page turns. And God says, let's write something beautiful, big, and new right now. So I don't know if you're in that place, man. I know I am. But let's believe that if we can start declaring his promises, stop doubting and denying and debating them, get our hearts right, that God will do something powerful. All right, let me get my friend Aaron up here so we can get you. Really, what? Are you nervous about it? Oh, okay, all right. Okay. All right. Happy birthday, Norma. It's actually Norma's birthday today. Is that all right for me to share all that with you? It's, it's a real struggle. But I, I'm in a place of real freedom right now over it. Now I drive over there, and I'm not like trying to be a son of thunder and call lightning down on that space. You know what I mean? It's, it, I'm, I'm freed up. Hallelujah. <laughs> Shaba. Okay, anyway, so Christmas promise. Let's lean into him, you guys. Oh, so earlier I said that there is a declaration of God's promise that I think really has the strongest possibility of determining your destiny. Do you, do you remember me saying that? Do you, do you want to know what that is? Come back next year. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Here it is. It's long, but check it out. When we confess with our mouth and heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, died for my sins, rose from the grave, conquered sin and death, empowered me in the Holy Spirit to live a life that is holy so that I might be reconciled in relationship with him and therefore destined for heaven and determined to have the characteristics of heaven enter me now is one of the declarations of promises that determines my eternal destiny with God, period. I know it's true. 
I'll say it again. It's fast. I didn't put any periods or commas in it. I know all the teachers are freaking out. Don't worry about it. When we confess with our mouth and heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, died for my sins, rose from the grave, conquered sin and death, empowered me in the Holy Spirit to live a life that is holy so that I might be reconciled in relationship with him and therefore destined for heaven and determined to have the characteristics of heaven enter me now is one of the declarations of a promise that determines my eternal destiny with God. I believe that. I live it. And I want you to have it more than anything today. Stand to your feet, beloved. Stand your hands. How many of you, how many of you are ready for a promise, man? Just, yeah, lift it up there. Come on. We're, you're going to make something up about promises in a minute. So be ready. So I'm going to pray, and then it's going to give you a moment to be ready. Ready? That's why you were nervous. You can't even hear me. Don't worry about it. Just, just do your thing. So Lord, just, we, have, we have a few minutes. Surprisingly, we have a few minutes. I'm going to ask that you just, you would help people navigate their promises right now. The places where they denied and debated and doubted. God, do the work in their, in their heart right now in this moment. They didn't come here by accident. Do the work. And Father, for those who are ready for a fresh promise, a, an ability to steward them at a new level, to think bigger, to see it farther and wider and deeper, God, that your love would invade the situation, that your will would be advanced, your kingdom would be advanced, you would be made famous on the earth by the declaration of our mouths. God, we're leaning into that over our families and life and health and finances. That, man, you're going to be made famous in this moment, God. Let that settle in, beloved. And let's believe for those promises right now. Aaron, just... just just something about promises would be great. Jesus, we receive it, God. Jesus, we receive it, God. I have a promise. It's from you. From you. Holding on to the promise. From Father, we receive it. We believe it, God. The gift of your promises. From you to me, God. Yeah, that's what we want. Just that sticker right on our heart like a Christmas present. From you to me, God. So, Lord, help us. Help us. Help us to be careful of our, of our mouths, Lord, and what we deny and debate and doubt. But that you would help us to be aligned and to declare, God, these incredible promises that would help guide and shape our destiny, that the, the destiny that you have and desire for us, Lord. It's more. It's more than we could ever imagine. Help us to be stewards of that. So, Father, we hold on to these promises and we say yes over them. We ask for you, God, to just breathe life into them and that you would release them into the people's hearts today, God. And that they would leave today knowing, most importantly, the great promise of Jesus, the Savior of the world, 
walks alongside, is in it, ready for you, moving you towards the great destiny that you have. God, for those here who are struggling that this chapter does not feel good, that, Lord, would you turn the page? Help them turn the page, God, to a new season, a new day, a new moment. And Lord, as we, as we look at the near end of this year and we look at the beginning of this next year, we say, yeah, Lord, breathe new life into it. We receive it. We believe it. May the peace of Christ, the hope of Christ, the love of Christ, and the joy of Christ be yours this Christmas. May all that God has declared in the promise of his son be yours. And as you leave this place, may you leave knowing he is for you forever, never against you. And he's here to say that I love you. Go in that grace and in that favor. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen. God bless you, CCF. I love you.